And there was instant pressure on us because people liked the beer. And if it tasted different one time, if he was trying something, people would report back. And it's like, it was very stressful. Hey all, Amanda here. Welcome to entry 67 of Great Beer Adventure. I still get crazy butterflies in my belly thinking about all of the fantastic people I have had the privilege to chat with due to these past 67 episodes and those that are coming your way in the next few weeks. Mm. Today we sit down with Peter Bissell of Bissell Brothers Brewing. While there are so many topics I could speak to him about, I mean, they are a marketing powerhouse and their beers are pretty tasty to boot. I chose to speak about the way the sibling dynamic changes when you start a business with your brother. My favorite part of all of the adventures that we have been on together is learning the the behind-the-scenes stories and connecting with people on an emotional level. There is so much passion in the beer industry that I get so very excited to be able to be part of it. For now, let's head to the new Bissell Brothers Tasting Room. Everybody, I am sitting in a very quiet tasting room at Bissell Brothers out on Thompson's Point. Is it Thompson's Point? Yeah. I get Thompson's yeah. Point and Thomas Point confused in my oh, head yeah. all the time. Yeah, yeah, Thompson's. Thompson's Point. And I mentioned that it's quiet. You may hear the air going or there's a train in the background, <laughs> but it there's nobody here. And the only reason is because you're closed. Otherwise, it would be mobbed here. <laughs> yeah, it's it's been it's been a very busy summer. And I am sitting here with Peter Vessel. Uh thank you so very much for joining me. This oh, has of been course. a yeah, thank you. long time in the coming. Yeah. <laughs> um if you could just tell my listeners just a little bit about yourself. They have heard from you once before in our summer Yeah, yeah, that was thing. a little bit more frazzled though. That was uh <laughs> I was working and um now this is uh this has got my full attention. So uh, I'm Pete Bissell, co-founder, co-owner of Bissell Brothers Brewing Company here in Portland, Maine. We have been serving beer for going on three years. It will be three years in December. And then in June of this year, we relocated the facility to this new beautiful building after two years at Industrial Way, which is sort of like locally famous now for incubating breweries. Um, we started there. There was three of us in the building Someone had to go. <laughs> not that we didn't get along, but just everyone's growing, and it, that building could not have held the growth for three breweries. So found out about this place. One thing led to another, and we began making the arrangements to get down here. And it was stressful at times, but, of course, in retrospect, it's just you know kind of a collective sigh of relief. Like, ah, I'm glad we did this. And um, the guys out there can, can grow as well. So, um, yeah, it's been... Um, Nice to get under our belts. Uh, we had a great summer, and we're looking forward to a uh, great fall and winter with uh, continued expansion and uh, just taking incremental steps to kind of get to where we're going. Yeah, this is a great spot that you are over here. You, <laughs> Your building is home to wine, beer, distilled items, chicken, Bigfoot, and a circus. Yes. Did yeah. I get them all? <laughs> yep. Uh, and and uh, um, Color Me Mine, the, uh, oh, the, the paint, paint Your Own pottery. pottery Studio, which is also BYOB. Yeah, it's quite an eclectic mix down here. Um, you obviously have the, the connection with the three um, alcoholic beverage producers. But uh, the other stuff, I think, is perfect complements to it. It keeps it diverse. It keeps it weird. The Cryptozoology Museum, as I understand it, you know, this is a pretty renowned place for that circle. And, you know, within... That type of establishment, it's it's really well known, and um, the owner Lauren Coleman is, you know, highly regarded in that field. Most people, when they see him, I, I knew when I first met him, I was like, oh, I've seen you on Bigfoot shows. Like, you know, if you're watching the History Channel or whatnot, and it's a show on Bigfoot, fact or fiction, or one of those, yeah. like, um, I can't remember the name of the one that I saw him in, but he was like one of the talking heads that it cuts to. So wow. he's definitely like a uh, expert in his field, and the Circus Conservatory which is now called Circus Maine. I think they went through a change in ownership. Um, just fantastic athleticism. People have asked me if it's a clown college, which I kind of laugh. Like, have you, have you gone in there? It's like shredded dudes and women, like, doing this insanely physical trapeze stuff. So they, uh, they got their, you know, that whole proving ground for future Cirque du Soleil performers and, and whatnot down there. 
So yeah, it's a pretty interesting mix. And we, of course, we have the concerts right out front here. Um, the uh, State Theater presents at Thompson's Point series uh, the final of this season. Leon Bridges is this Friday. Should be great. And uh, then it'll be time to look towards the winter, um, the hockey rink and the public skating rink, right. the yurt bar, um, et cetera, et cetera. So they've, they've got some other stuff planned for that this winter. It's gonna, there's going to be a tubing hill as well. Fantastic. Um, yeah. I think that one of my favorite parts about being, um, I'm, I'm just outside of South Portland. Yep. I'm just outside of Portland in South Portland. Oh, okay. And um, one of my favorite things about being so close to Portland and being in the beer industry and even a small way Mm -hmm. is I love the creativity and all that is around and how everybody kind of feeds off each other and gets better and more creative and pushes themselves. And I think this building with the diversity is just a huge like example of what Portland really is. Yeah, I I think you're correct. And I don't think I would have been... Not necessarily open to us, but this type of thing we just didn't even conceive when we um, when we first opened that the need for such a rapid expansion while sticking to you know just producing our beer and selling our beer mainly in house. But beyond that, in terms of draft, just Maine, mostly Southern Maine. But that's the way the industry's panned out. And uh, it's funny, I've lived here eleven years. I didn't th- this peninsula didn't register to me until like two years ago. I had. You know, I'd never heard of it. It's buildings that you just fade into the background from the highway. Yeah. They were just abandoned. There was no reason for anyone to come down here. It's just funny now to think back to when I would happen to look off the highway and see the buildings and all, you know, that was before the area got developed. So yeah. I think it's a boon to Portland. It's like a whole new neighborhood. This is just phase one, this building, Brick North, that we're in now. The building and developing is going to continue. We will see several structures, big public use facilities erected down here in the coming years. Fantastic. Um, Obviously the other existing brick building, Brick South, is getting developed now as we speak. So And I I think for I know that so many people have walked through your brewery already, even though you've only been here for a few months. But I think it's really important to all of my listeners just to point out all of the different forms of art that you have in here, the artistry in here is just beautiful from Thanks. the tanks that TIGPRO does that are very, very industrial, but beautiful mm. to the graffiti. And is this metal that's been punched behind? Like what is that's wood. That's, that's wood. The, um, we're talking about the bar facade, which is really the wall of our walk-in cooler. Yeah, that was conceived and orchestrated by a man named Forrest Stone, young guy. Um, he does all our wood and metal work. He did the bar. He did uh, this table that we're sitting at. He did the stools. Really, really fine craftsman. And what a name, Forest Stone. Yeah. That's, uh, and was that a birth given? Or is yeah. It, oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. So when we were hashing out the development, one of the first pl- things that Noah and I did was place the walk-in because these wood beams, um, original 1903, these wood beams throughout give from a, a top-down perspective, sort of like a grid appearance. So it actually helped us plan the brewery because looking at this, uh, the, the blueprint, it was you know like a natural grid, and 20 by 25 feet. So we decided to place the walk-in between one sort of unit on the grid, if you will, and we knew that the back would be what people in the tap room would see. So I came to Forrest and I, I said, the only stipulation I have is that I really want the logo. I, I, I want some, I, there needs to be a centerpiece. So the logo in the middle backlit in some way and then beyond that all that i care about is that like when people come in there's got to be a holy shit moment so he followed through in spades with that those are regular just wood planks that, that went up and he chainsawed the divots and then buffed it down with him and his wife worked together and he, he had a team in here a few nights buffed it down and then stained it and that's what you get wow that yeah. is amazing <laughs> i wouldn't I, I had no idea what it was it, yeah. it is just gorgeous. Yeah, it's pretty special. We're lucky to have it. Everyone, you know, it's just kind of like, okay. And I'm happy to get into fall now because people haven't seen the taproom ambiance at night because we're only open 12 to 8. Right. And we've only been open for the summer, so it's literally always been in daylight. So yeah. as we get into the fall now, people You'll begin to see that. you have a good four or five yeah, hours of yeah, night. Yeah. <laughs> and your wife put together some tables for the... Uh, yeah, my wife did some touch-ups to some of our these tables. 
did uh, varnish coats and whatnot. They were pretty beat up. And then she she did the the skateboard table, which is popular for photos. Um, and those boards were all ridden by uh, Mr. Seth Viggy back there, finishing the brew day over the last 15 years or so. So they wow. um, they're all worn in and beaten up. Um, and and she erected that table, and it's a very popular spot for photos and Instagram check ins and whatnot. <laughs> so so. I probably have not touched on everything that I should touch on, but we have not even started the actual show yet. Let's go to round one right away, Absolutely. which is drinking. What are we drinking today? So you poured me something. I told you a couple that I hadn't tried yet, and yeah. you poured me one of them. So I poured you Dangle, which is, um, we bill it as an adjunct ale with lime. And by adjuncts, I mean that it was fermented with something other than malted grain, mm-hmm. the sort of building block, if you will, of a craft beer. Um, yeah. What makes this an adjunct ale is that we use rice and corn, which are much cheaper to, to get. And they're, you, you know, that's what you're going to find that ferments any macro, you know, Budweiser, Miller, anything like that. They're going to use adjuncts because it's much less expensive. And it obviously leads to a sort of thinness. Yeah. But what we want to do, so it is inspired by beers like Bud Light Lime, um, sort of, you know, macros answer to, like, the summer beer. It started as a joke. Sniff uh, unapologetically loves Bud Light Limes. And, you know, a few years ago, we were looking to do a, an event. It was our first summer. And um, Noah brewed a pilot of this because we wanted to really look at, well, what's to be said for Bud Light Lime? Because obviously in the craft world, everyone, you know, treats Anheuser-Busch like, like Hitler. And uh, to some extent, that may be true, but... Um, we wanted to look at it with sort of an objective point of view and just wonder, okay, well, millions of people drink these beers every day. And they're not all idiots. So why are they drinking them? And, I mean, it's Bud Light Lime on a beach. F- for me, it's like I can't do real craft beers. If I'm at the beach, I would just get filled up so fast, like out in the hot, hot sun. If I'm drinking, if that's the plan, Bud Light Lime or something like that, like I can't, you know... There's a time and place for these beers, and uh, the crushability, I will say, of the adjuncts of the corn. And for the lime, I don't know where Anheuser Bush gets their lime. Um, who knows? I, I doubt it's from zesting limes for as much beer as they're making. Um, so we, we zested 400 pounds of limes for each batch, and the zest Holy was moly. added to the fermenter. So you get a real raw, you're probably tasting a real raw, yeah. very like authentic lime taste, coupled with a... 5% ABV, definitely, you know, the same type of utility that you would find in a beer like Bud Light Lime, camping, boating, something where the beer can just flow easily with a manageable ABV. Um, but yeah, it started as a joke, um, Dangles, an inside joke that we won't get into, but that, that's, that had to be the beer's name. The, the barbecues were called the Dangle Summer Barbecue when we did them at Industrial Way. And um, it wasn't until here that we really had the flexibility to brew it on a large scale. So we did a 40-barrel batch uh, to re- be released on 4th of July weekend, and then we capped off the summer with it just this past weekend with uh, Labor Day batch. So it's fun to experiment like this and take risks and just kind of see what a beer like this, you know, I think it, it's a very good example of creativity in craft brewing. Uh, h- happy we did it. Yeah, I actually, I really like it, and I don't know that I would <laughs> think that Bud Light or any of those are Hitler necessarily, but well, you know what I mean. Yeah, like, no, the, you know, the, they're they're, the, they're the enemy for sure. Yeah. And, um, no, I get. I completely understand. I'm, but I'm I, down with that. I'm down with that totally. But I think more people should look at the beers they're making. Yeah. Because the all these people that drink this, they're not all idiots. Like, well, and the fact that they have ten, at least ten different facilities, and they all taste the exact yeah, same. Yeah. That is crazy to me. From a QC perspective, yeah. yeah. They, well, I mean, like. I haven't toured. Um, one of my good friends has done contract work. Not He's not a brewer, um, but he's, he's, he's an electrician. And he's, he's, he did contract work at a facility in Texas. And he said these huge, vast facilities have like two employees. Because it's Holy all moly. like... Automated? Totally automated. Wow. Yeah. But, um, um, yeah. But I do think that you do get that actual lime flavor. And I think that's what really... Yeah, yeah. The nose on it. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I, I hopefully we'll get a little bit of an Indian summer here. 
I'm loving the fall feels, but just yeah. another hot weekend for everyone to finish up their cans of that because yeah. that is definitely a hot weather. I think this drinker. is a really good gateway beer for those folks that haven't had craft beer because yeah. they just don't like it. Yeah. But if you could get them drinking this, I don't think it would be very far before they would hop, skip, yeah. and jump over to something <laughs> else. And we're just going to mention the fact that you're drinking seltzer tonight because it is. I've seen so much around there. I love seltzer. It seems like there's a, a big following for seltzer yeah. right now. I am drinking a bomber of polar raspberry pink lemonade seltzer. Been on the seltzer train for over a year. I love that. It's Well, Amanda and I were talking when we before we started the actual flow of the podcast on how if I'm doing work at home or if, I'm, if I've got a design project or something going on, you've got to be drinking. Not necessarily beer, but I had, tend to have good beer at the house. So sometimes you get two or three in on, you know, double IPAs or something, and it's like, man, I can't focus. I can't, like, perform exactly how I need to. And it's not that I need to be drinking beer. It's that I just need to be drinking something carbonated. So the seltzer's definitely helped out in that regard. I think I'm a little bit behind the times. I, I wanted some of these flavors canned, but apparently they already are. I'm just going to the wrong stores. So <laughs> yes, I'm, you gotta I'm go about to Target. hunt <laughs> ISO. Yes, there's a huge <laughs> ISO out yeah. on fancy seltzer have you tried the i haven't been able to make the jump have you tried the seltzer alcoholic ones that they have no um my wife had friends up last week and one of them was talking about that i gotta find it they're out everywhere i just for me if i'm gonna drink something i want a good beer if i want no. to not have alcohol i'll drink seltzer i don't know it's hard for me it's they just, are a great mixer if you're like watching your weight you know, that mixed with vodka is probably about as lean as you can get for a, a drink. So, yeah. no, I haven't, haven't come across those yet, but... Yeah. Okay, so we're done with that. We're moving right along. And the real reason that I specifically wanted to talk to you, we were at a summer session, um, mm. and you were talking to me about your first beer memory, which is going to make round three a little bit more difficult for you. You're going to have to fish a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> but you were talking about how... When you were younger, you know, the big brother, Noah, you've mentioned him before. Mm. He's your younger brother, and he's the brewer here. And, but you were talking about how, you know, you were that big brother, and he wanted to work where you had worked and all of that stuff. And then later on, now you kind of have to let him take the reins now that we're brewing. And that just really intrigued me so much. I'd love to know a little bit more about that story, about how your sibling <laughs> relationship has changed and morphed. Yeah, I think it's a unique concept. And I do think, not just in brewing, but in business in general, there um, you, you do come across siblings. Um, you have that baseline, you know? So for those listening, uh, I'm 33, and my brother's 26. We're, I think, calendar-wise, we're six and a half years apart, because um, he'll be 27 in December, and I was 33 last month. So we're about six and a half years apart. So... Growing up, you know, that amount of time is substantial. For a while, you know, we didn't have the same friends. We were always close. But again, as close as you can be with that age gap. But I think one of the things that set us up to be able to do the business is that there was never sibling rivalry. Like, I never wanted what he had. You know, I think that can manifest itself when you are closer in age. Um, so there was never any of that. We weren't trying to one-up each other then or now. That just has never been a thing. And I think that, again, can, can appear. Uh, it almost, I think, would, when that does appear, it, it drives, not drives siblings apart, but, like, they wouldn't want to do something like this together. Right. Because um, I think there's, a, like, this need to do your own thing or, or find your own way or whatnot. But, uh, yeah, like you said, uh, you know, six and a half years is old enough where I was always sort of, like, the leader Growing up, not even a leader, just I was a leader de facto just because I was so much older than he was, but I would introduce him to new things. I would kind of show him, oh, here's your first R-rated movie <laughs> in my room and stuff like that. Do you remember what that was? No, it was uh, like Predator or, um, you know, it's one of, those, one of those types of things. But he always did his own thing. We grew up in a neighborhood where there were kids my age and kids his age. And I mean, it was a very small town anyway, but... At the time, we hadn't lived here some, somewhere like this, so it, it felt small or it felt bigger. Um, the high school and the middle school were right behind our house. And then as I grew older, you know, first concerts, taking him, we came to Sum 41 down in Portland. 
he was young still. I was I had to have been a senior in high school, and that was really fun. I'll always remember that. And then we went to Warp Tour when I was out of college. That was later on. That was in like 2007, 2008. There's always that type of thing. Like, oh, we'll we'll go. I'll, I've got a car. You know, I'll kind of show you this type of thing. And that again, that came from being really, really young and. Okay, well, I have to show you this hilarious home videos of us uh, that my mom's kept when we were in, like, Cub Scouts and whatnot. And I, Noah's just toddling along, and, and we're both just yapping into the camera. It's really, really funny. Yeah, it definitely morphed. I rem- I'll never forget when he came to me and said he wanted to do this. Been talking a lot, a lot about beer. By that, I mean for, like, six months. Trying a lot of different beers together. And I, I was already kind of in the game of business with my photo business. And that was, at the time, what I, what I thought I was going to do, deep into it and doing well and learning as much as I could, not just about photography, but the, the mechanics of, of business and how to differentiate yourself. That, I realized with that business, is such a huge part of it. You learn the techniques as you go. You learn the, the technical aspect by doing. You have to study for some stuff. You can't right. just, that was, wasn't what was important. A photo is a photo. It becomes unique when you inject yourself into it and you make it something that's different. So I realized that differentiation was very much as important as, you know, the actual, and and some people may think otherwise, quality still matters. Quality matters the most, but quality is subjective now. Everything, whether it's brewing or photos, you have a million options, right? Podcast. Um, Yeah, yeah, you have a million (laughs) options. So... Quality is subjective because quality means different things to different people. Uh, in most industries, beer included, there's some overarching things that, okay, well, your beer can't have diacetyl in it. Right. It's got to be carbonated. Things like that, that that pretty much are objective. But beyond that, what's quality is subjective. So you got to carve your own thing out. You can't try to copy what's been done before, what could be, what you could never do better than, you know, you got to... Do what comes naturally. And uh, I realized that with my business and spoke a lot about that with Noah, who then said, okay, look, like, I want to do this. We should do this together. I don't want to work for someone else. And, uh, And that's where it started. And it's a shock, I will say. Building the business, it was what it was. Took a long time. Um, not that long in retrospect. Two years from the idea, the, the conception and the first like chattings about it to being open isn't that bad. And really, most of the work happened in one, in the from like February 2013 or January 2013 till opening that December. That was when the majority of the work happened. You know, we worked together through that opening. Then it's like you see a sibling, you see your sibling in a different light. Because then, I don't know, it just um it was like a, a switch had been flipped. You see these other traits in someone when you're then all of a sudden like with them every day, day in day out. For both of us, I looked at him. He you know, like never kept his phone charged. <laughs> it was things like that, and that was driving me crazy. And th- the place was a disaster, messy, also mainly from him. And I, on the other hand, which I didn't realize this till afterwards, but I was like, I became like this megalomaniac, flipping out over stuff like that, over everything. And that was. In retrospect, I realized we were both dealing with the pressure and stress of this in our own ways. Um, at the time, it was harder to process. I was off my rocker, and he was just like, you look at him and be like, what? You're going to, like, brew for this? Like, what are you doing? You know, un- unable to be reached. The place was a disaster. But he was learning. He was preparing for this. It was very stressful opening, just with, like, learning the equipment and whatnot. Oh, God, it was the most stressful time of my life those two or three weeks like around the first brew and I was dealing with my, my own way and he was dealing with his but it was like you you all of a sudden see this person that you know so well in like a different light then and it's like I saw all these traits which he's not the cleanest person he never has been and he never will be and that's fine but it was like I was seeing these traits for the first time like oh my god and I was a total asshole it definitely went both ways in retrospect we've talked about it and you, when you go into business with a sibling, you, in many ways, have to, like, renegotiate your relationship. Like you were saying, you know, I had kind of been the leader, and now we were peers. And that's part of, like, I knew that, and that's part of what I was looking at, what I was seeing. And I was like, oh, my God. But I was just as bad. 
it, it really was a shock, but we've always wanted the same things. It's funny, like, when times are good for me, like this summer, there's like this void created because I got nothing to push against because everything is going great. So we always want the same things, and we realize that after a few blow-ups, you know, at the outset. Um, but for me, as an older brother, again, I don't know what it's like to be a younger brother. I never will. But for me, I had to, like, really work at, okay, our relationship's different now. It's this new thing. And you got to accept the other person. you got to accept their personality traits. It just is what it is. We wouldn't have it, any of this without him. So I don't care if he's not the cleanest person. You know, I've, I've made my peace with all that. I don't, he's gotten much better with communication. Um, I think he kind of realized that. You know, we're years into it now. I, I know it teaches you to know yourself more than I think I certainly did. At the very beginning, I didn't see what an asshole I was being. And now I catch, you know, if I get mad at something, I catch myself, and it's usually nothing. But it's good because, I don't know, I just feel like we need to go through that period because wouldn't, we wouldn't have known about these things about ourselves, you know, like it is definitely like part of running a business is growing the self. It's, it's self, you know, improvement and whatnot. And there's been many different ways that the business has allowed that for us. But that interpersonal thing with him is, I don't know what else would have done that. You start with this idea and so much of it at the outset is the work to get that idea out to the people. But then at this point, you got to learn, like you got to be a manager of people. Like that's a whole other thing. You got to make long-term financial projections and decisions with huge amount. I mean, this is a this is a business that scales. This isn't like a it's, it wasn't like my photography business with just me and a camera. This business scales, and there's a lot of people and a lot of money involved. You got to make the right people, choices. People count on yeah. you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That personal development has helped tremendously. When we sit down and have chats, it's just good to get that honest feedback and. Again, we're a long ways from, from those blow-ups at the outset. I think we both... So did re- you have a couple pretty big ones? Did Not it- over any one thing, but we just, we fought. Yeah. Um, we fought. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I, we were did both making... Did you as kids? What's up? Did you as kids as well, or is this a new thing since no, the business? No, no, we never fought. Oh, wow. No, we never fought growing up. Oh, and this, it was just about... Phone but chargers we, and cleanliness? Not, 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 <laughs> not even just that, but like we, were, uh, we both were making what decisions that we thought were right. And uh, a lot of times the other one wouldn't think so. But this was just at the beginning, you know, yeah. it was and there was instant pressure on us because people liked the beer. And uh, if it tasted different one time, if he was trying something, people would report back and it's like it was very stressful. And then just all the stuff with the cans because we canned pretty much the get go. And man, there's never enough. And it was people were like, there's just for the rec- record, it's still, I don't think you, I think you could be as big as Anheuser Busch and still not have enough because oh. you are so loved that the lines out of this place oh, on thanks. can day is crazy. Oh God, I remember like the, we, we would open, the tasting room wasn't, we didn't know what we were doing. We'd be open, pours out of the refrigerator, we'd do full pints. Uh, that are in our little tasting room. We had like we'd have like ten cases to sell a case per person. <laughs> yeah, um, is- but no, it's been great. I do think going into business with a sibling, regardless. I, mean, I only have this one experience to go on, but right. I think regardless, it will uh, definitely change the relationship, hopefully for the better, and it will allow you to kind of see into your own faults. Because for most siblings, and I'm speculating a little bit here, but you know, you, you are siblings, that's what you are, but then this, this becomes this new dynamic. You know, you're business partners too, and you have different needs. Yeah. And, um, and you have definitely, uh, you have different methods of, of getting from point A to point B, but the good thing is with us is that it's, the point B is always the same. You know, we always know what we need to do. It's almost telepathic at this point. We know what we need to do when we need to do it. Uh, we knew this fall we need to introduce a dark beer, for instance, it was just time, you know? Right. So Umbro will come out uh, first week of next month. It'll be regularly produced oatmeal stout. We knew we needed to have that, like a non-adjunct, labor-intensive, just a really, really good oatmeal stout or a stout, a dark right. beer of any kind, and that's what we chose. So it's good, and, you know, the family aspect continues out past him and I, you know. Hester's obviously been with us since close to the beginning, and then my wife. Hester is Noah's fiance. Yep, yep. And my parents are always down here trying to help out when they can. So it's, um, 
it permeates out, and we're in this for the long haul. You know, it's been nothing. It's not even three you years in. You mentioned v- v- Vanessa earlier, and she's yep. your wife. Yep, yep. Just she's to in the- help make oh, all the yeah, connections yeah. for everybody. <laughs> and, um, you know, we're just getting started, you know, not, not even three years in, so... Yeah. There's still a long way to go, and that family aspect of it will continue to, I think, overshadow. It, it, it will stay with the company. Um, family values, for sure, even with the people that aren't related to us. If you're like me, we have like our family, and then we have the family. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the yeah. extended folks that we've decided yeah. to. And Felix is here. He's your son. He's yeah. two. Yep. And he's he's here on a yep. somewhat regular basis, right? Yeah, yeah. If Vanessa's working, I try not to bring him in. Just because he'll Cause a lot. Because he's two. It's a lot. Um, <laughs> it's just because he's but two. But at company events and whatnot, he's usually here. Um, he loves running around and riding on James's skateboards. Um, <laughs> loves knowing Hester's dog, Kelsa. Just great to have around, but it's a facility. Right. He's been pretty good last few times. Uh, hasn't got, tried to get into the chemicals or anything. Well, that's good. Um, <laughs> it's a step ahead of where my yeah. kid would be at. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she's, a, she's lovely, but yeah. a monster. <laughs> Um, as you were talking, I was really thinking about how for so much of my life, I really feel like you kind of wear different masks with different people and you kind of in, you know, your family, when you start moving away from them and start doing your own thing, you develop this other person that you are. Not that it's different, but Mm -hmm. different traits come out and different things come out. And I have found that sometimes it's hard to show that side to the people that knew me when I was growing up. They mm-hmm. know me a certain way. Yeah. That's who I am. Yeah. And, you know, it really seems like, thankfully, you and Noah were so close that even though you both had grown and become these, you know, different people mm-hmm. as you got older, you were able to see that in each other. Otherwise, I don't think it would have worked. <laughs> like, yeah. It really seems like you're able to grow together. Yeah, I, I, I definitely understand what you're saying. We thankfully don't have to... Uh, Really put up too much facades. You know, I put the face, if, if I need to be out in public, I'll be a certain way, but it's really not that much different, and neither is how he is. Um, I don't think I mean fake, though. I mean, like, yeah. you know, when I was a kid, I wasn't as comfortable in my own skin as mm-hmm. I am now. So I was a lot more, like, on edge. Mm-hmm. And so my family members that I don't see very often mm-hmm. know that person. Yeah. And so it's not that it's fake. It's just... It, you just kind of fall back into that. They yeah. know you this one way, yep. and yep. and you've just grown. And but luckily, it seems like you're all, both really close and have grown together. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, I'm really impressed with. Uh, at the end of the day, I am still his big brother, so yeah. I can say things like this. <laughs> I'm really impressed with. I mean, he's had a lot of pressure, and you know, at this point, it doesn't go away. With every new thing we do, it's got to be on a certain level now. And you know, he did a lot of the stuff at an age. You know, we opened; he was 23. Wow. I wasn't doing that at 23. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't, no, have had a, I wouldn't have had the mental gumption to do it. So I want to do a book eventually about just this type of stuff because it's fascinating to me. But we always talk about this. People see this sexy finish on if you're at an event or if you have like a big release. They see that and that's visible. And what you don't see is like the work it takes to get there. And one of the things like when we were starting the company was like, we don't have that much personal time. The summer of 2013 was so busy. All we were doing was working at the pig. I was fulfilling every photo contract I had because I had booked whatever I could to help pay for everything. So we were working full, and then every other second was spent working on the business plan and raising money and, and learn, you know, that you want to talk about a fast track to learn. All right, we raised $350,000 in like four months. Wow. Uh, we're not from that world. He had the gumption to do all that. And you got to step out of to, – to get anything going, you have to step out of mainstream society. You have to step out of your friends living for Friday night and going out because the main mainstream culture is about work is something that to get through, to, to get, get to the time week. when you're not working. Mm-hmm. Most people don't like their jobs. And I'm not being pessimistic or like turning this into some huge case for entrepreneurship, but it is like you open your eyes when you go down this road and you see that most of society is much less engaged and in some many cases totally like disengaged from their job. It's just a means to an end to enjoy life outside of work. And when you go down, you know, the entrepreneurial path or the path to mastery, whatever you want to call it, it involves being completely engrossed and engaged in what's going to make you money. 
but that's not the way the world around you works. So, I mean, I, we didn't do anything, you know, we were at the pig or working on this and I'm not putting us up on a pedestal. We did what we had to do. We saw our friends at the pig luckily, but I would have been too impatient at 23. I would have wanted to have more fun. Um, that's the other thing is, you know, deferring the fun. <laughs> fun doesn't come. Fun came. Right. Fun came eventually. But uh, for a lot of that time, it was just work and learning about brewing, learning about all these processes that you need to employ, heavy machinery, um, the building out of stuff. It was very daunting to us. Um, but we just, that's what I say to people. Like, there's no, and again, this might be a chat for another time, but there's nothing stopping you from doing this other than that time and that commitment. And everyone's got the same amount of time. You choose, it sounds so corny, but like you choose how you spend those 24 hours. Yeah. And uh, if you might not know anything about a subject, but you can learn pretty fast if you're really going to lean into, you got time to do it. You, yeah. Say you don't have time to do something as an excuse. Because people that have had less time than Noah and I have done this, done this type of thing, you know? Right. I get you. I hear it completely. And you mentioned that, you know, you'd love to write a book about this kind of thing because that's why I'm doing this podcast. I love, no, I love being the person that knows what's going on behind the scenes. Yeah. Like that stuff is so intriguing to me and I'm so curious. That's why as soon as you started talking about that relationship, I'm like, oh, I need to know more. Yeah. And, you know, there's yeah. a lot of different, I don't know, there's just so much that just really is very intriguing to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that kind of brings us right to round three, you know, digging to learn more about people. You have already shared with us your first beer memory. So any significant beer memory at this point would be lovely. A lot of the beer memories have to do with this place. I can imagine. Um, I, we forgot to mention, like, the stacks on stacks on stacks of cans. It's a lovely wall you've made. Yeah, I, that was how I spent today was um, moving cans, moving Baby Genius out to the warehouse and then getting Swish back, queued up for Swish's debut in a few months. This and, is like uh, a beer mecca. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we call it tet- la- la- large-scale Tetris when the cans have to be rearranged. I had a few accidents with the forklift. I see, Lost a few I cans. see a couple of dent cans. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I saw some coming in. I see some yeah. from here. It's funny, this time of year will always bring me back to opening Industrial Way. Or, and when I say opening, I don't mean the tasting room. I just mean like brewing there. The smell of fermentation in there in November. It was like November 21st when we, you know, it was the day after the first brew and very stressful, under a lot of pressure, taught by a man named Michael LaCherity. He's famous or infamous, depending on who you talk to. In, he was in, on this podcast, in episode three. Oh, great. Michael taught us how very well how to brew basically the equipment the process because again the equipment can vary in manufacturer but it's really it's the same th- it's the same stuff um, whether you're home brewing or brewing on a large scale it's the same you're doing the same process but you have to you need to learn how to use all the stuff and michael was our teacher and uh, a harsh teacher when he needed to be uh, which he did there was a lot on the line Again, it made for a stressful time, his method of teaching, but in retrospect now, I totally see why it, you know, there was a lot on the line. You know, we almost fucked up a few times the next time when he was taking more of a backseat, but he was still there and he jumped in. He was like, what are you doing? It's like, oh man, he did a great job. Um, we'll always be indebted to Michael for that, uh, for, you know, making the stuff's one thing, but then it's like, well, what do we do? So, uh, we got through that and, uh. I'll never forget that time of year. My father was down a bunch. So it was me, Seth, and Noah, and my father, and Michael, for, like, all this. (laughs) And we just kept going out to the brewery. It was always first thing in the morning every day. And um, just the smell, you know, the excitement of waking up. Everything was new and novel. And I I tell myself this. Now it's, it's changed. I look at this facility there, and it's... I don't think anything of it. I look at our insane canning line and like all this stuff and I, I don't think anything of it anymore but when all these things were introduced into our lives I was I remember like just standing in the dark when the new canning line came in and just staring at it in the crate like and that was the same for every new thing that we've implemented I remember the first today when I was moving the cans around I was looking at pallets of substance I, I'll never forget when the door of the truck opened and the first cans were there it was just like, because it took so long, it was just like, when is this going to happen, and when are they going to come, and it was incredible. We unloaded them by hand, because you could get half pallets back in the day, and uh, we didn't have a forklift. It was still rugged for two guys to do, but we did what we had to do, you know? 
So I tell myself to keep letting yourself get amazed. You got to like keep looking for that feeling. And I, every, every November now, I think about how it smelled. I remember coming in there and smelling the yeast, smelling the fermentation and be like, oh my God, Noah checking gravity and he hit all his numbers and we were just like, oh wow, we're going to have beer soon. The terror of like kegging, another thing that we didn't know what we were doing. Um, everyone was waiting at the Thirsty Pig. We were, the beer, we couldn't get the beer into the kegs. I fainted. Uh, oh, no. That was like, yeah, that was a crazy, you know, so it was all these things for the, for the first time. S- hearing people talk about us at a bar and like seeing people next to us with like glassware just talking about us, not knowing who we are. It was like, man, I'll never forget that. Like really seeing that, oh, like I'm affecting someone's life. Someone is like talking about what we've done. All those firsts, yeah. all those firsts. You get jaded, you, you, you know, you, you can forget. So I try to look around and find that now because it, it does get harder and harder. Yeah, I, I think about that every November. The first, that will always be my, one of my greatest beer memories now was making our beer for the first time. We didn't know what we were doing. Me, Seth, and Noah standing there. Oh, man. I'll never forget the cereal smell of like mashing in for the first time. Yeah. And does it dry you back, that smell? Oh, absolutely. Whenever I'm up on the brew platform and they're brewing, it's like, oh, man. Uh, I will always remember that day. And uh, just looking around at the equipment and being like, oh, my God, we fucking did it. It was, it was equal parts like pride and like terror because, again, it was like, okay, well, we have to deliver so hard now. Like everyone is expecting all this craziness and we have to do it. And uh, those days were full of like incredible highs and incredible lows. Money was so tight. Sales were never bad, but again, we spent everything we had right. to open, and it was that this is a industry of, you know, very high, a lot of money in, and you're spending a lot of money, and the margins in there. So it was like we had to spend a lot even after we first opened, and it was just barely there. Um, so there was that added stress. You know, I no and I were barely paying ourselves, and then I found out Vanessa was pregnant. So that that first six months was insane soaring highs and like terrifying lows it was you'd always come out and there'd be something broken and then we started canning on the manual canner and that was a whole other realm of like there's actually a video of you guys and, using the uh the manual you were on local brew tv oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah so if anybody wants to check out what they how it used to be happen you can go to local brew tv was that that was that was god that was october 2014 yeah it was a while. i remember that like it was yesterday too Doing the, the, the stickering production lines, yeah. all this stuff. But yeah, the, the manual, you know, in canning, and that's another thing. You know, we, I, I will say, I feel like some breweries now want things like too quick and easy. But we learned what we needed to know. We learned about pressure and temperature and carbonation. And it was difficult, but I'm very happy we did that because we all have a deep understanding of what's going on in that bright tank and what the beer needs to be at to be packaged and now we have it much easier, but that was all we could afford, and there was no there were no cans in the market. Right. It was just, the, you know, Baxter was like the right. smallest brewery canning. There was nothing. I went out, so I'm going on a trip. We're doing this at the beginning of September. I'm going on a trip, and I'm going to go meet people. I'm like, I'm bringing Maine beer. Nice. <laughs> and so I go out, and I was like, I have to bring, drive it quite a ways. I'm thinking about what I'm going to buy. I'm like, I don't really want to get cans. I don't really want to get bottles, I mean, because yeah. they'll break possibly in the yeah. cooler. And it didn't matter. Everything I grabbed was in cans. Yeah. It's crazy how much. But you're right. Back then, it was... Yeah. So we knew we had to do that. Yeah. And we had to have them painted and have it looking good. And I'm glad we did. And, you know, I'm, In retrospect, there's not much I would have changed. And I'm happy that we did things sort of... I don't want to say the hard way. But like, I feel like part of it is like being willing to do things that someone else might not be. Like unload all this shit by hand. We didn't have a forklift. Yeah. Unload all this shit by hand. Um, the manual canning was not fun. It was long, frustrating days. But I'm, that's what we had to do. And we did it. And now it's easier rather than just trying to, like, jump right in at this level. But, yeah, no, uh, big beer memories out of there. Yeah. The, uh, the initial six months was, uh, wow, it was something. <laughs> for me, the smell of um, spent grain. Yep. Yeah, that's a huge one for me. Yep. I've been, I was gone from a brewery for a few months this mm-hmm. summer, and I walked in to Mass Landing a week ago, and I yeah. just walked back in the back way here. Yeah. And both times I'm just like, "Whoo, yeah, I'm back. Yeah. All right, yeah. we're here. You know we're ready to go." Yeah. 
Okay, so we're on to our last round. This one's a little bit of a different style. There are, I've got a few different random questions. One night I was sitting there and I just Googled random questions, getting to know you type thing. <laughs> and I wrote some down. So I don't know exactly what is on these, um, but you pick one and then I'll pick one. Okay. And um, then we'll each ask it. Do you want to go first? Okay, sure. Who is your hero? Oh, um... I don't know. This is actually really a difficult question for myself. Um, so I think I think I've got a couple. <laughs> One, I really like how Johnny Cash didn't really care much about what other people yeah. said he wanted, and he just kind of went out and he did it himself. Topic is switched to the Man in Black. <sighs> I I love the Man in Black. I have. <laughs> if you're a regular listener of the show, well, you know awesome. that. That's awesome. Oh, that's great. Um, my husband and I, I actually in my um, vows to him at our wedding, I. I quoted Johnny Cash. Wow. And then the other one around the same kind of idea is, um, of course, for both of my <laughs> quote unquote heroes, they definitely have flaws. <laughs> Johnny Cash has huge flaws, as does Walt Disney. But Walt Disney, the way that he was able to go from having nothing and seeing, having this dream and. His story is something. I looked into is, it. It is, yeah. yeah. It's and very, so, very inspiring. And <laughs> two different, very different sides, yeah. two very flawed people. But. Johnny Cash and Walt Disney World. Uh, Walt Disney and all of. Well, I don't stuff. know what people expect. Um, everyone's human. Yeah. And uh, I, I think our society tends to sort of like ascribe godlike characteristics to people that have found great success. And it's not the right thing to do because everyone's human. And, uh, and then it's almost like we're let down when we see that they're real people right. and they have real issues and stuff like that. It's like, well, what did you expect? Like, yeah. but it's also inspiring because it means anyone can change the world. Right. And that's the thing is that, and that's kind of, you know, they have all this stuff that's going against them, but they're able to do so much and, and inspire so many people. And I definitely am a very flawed human being but hopefully maybe for a couple people i can inspire them Absolutely, too and yeah. at least try some new beer yeah right <laughs> i'm i'm always amazed by these guys before the internet like like what walt disney did i mean man with no like infrastructure no yeah. you know no networking you could you, not google you that. gotta <laughs> just really believe in yourself um it's really really cool yeah okay your turn if you could only eat one meal for the rest of your life what would it be one is a little bit limiting. I would probably, we were just talking about this a while ago. I would do um, steak tips, grilled, medium with uh, sea salt and black pepper, and then chimichurri. Oh, I love Yep, chimichurri. just that. That's everything you need. And yeah, that's um, every time I make that. I have steak tips at the house. I'm going to do a steak Caesar tonight. But making chimichurri isn't super long, but it's it takes a minute, and you got to buy a bunch of herbs. Yeah. And um, I just wasn't up for it tonight, but fresh chimmy with uh, my mouth watering. With, um, Mine too. With a nice lean steak rubbed with salt and pepper. Man, that's everything I need. Yeah. My mouth's watering now. <laughs> <laughs> the ch- oh, the chimichurri, you got me right yeah. there. I do, yeah. I do love red meat, uh, but you add that on top of it. Yeah. It's <laughs> so good. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so now that we're both really hungry, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you so very much for coming and meeting me at a quiet brewery. Which It's nice to be out here sometimes yeah. um, like this. It's good. I, no, thank you. And uh, sorry if I seemed meandering or scatterbrained. Um, tends to happen with this type of thing. So hopefully your listeners can, can glean something from it. I, I think we got a lot of really great information. We good. know you and Noah a little bit more. And I really, really appreciate you uh, chatting with me about Absolutely. siblings. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a great topic to explore. And um, again, hopefully people can, um, can garner something from all the other little tidbits as I yammer on. So well, thank cheer- you for having me. Thank you. And cheers to you. Thank you so much to Peter Bissell for sharing such an amazing interview with me. I have an even deeper appreciation for Peter and Noah and all they did to bring Bissell beer to the masses. Have you ever worked with family? Did you go through some of the same things Peter and Noah did? I would love to hear about it. Really? It is so intriguing to me. Let me know on Twitter at GreatBeerADV how it all worked out. I'll be back next week with our first brewery bio from Connecticut. We're really starting to take over the world now, guys.
If you all, our fabulous co-adventurers, would like to support the show, check out our Patreon page. For less than the cost of a beer, you can show us some love. Go to greatbeeradventure.com slash support. If you want to see even more from our adventures, follow us on Instagram at Great Beer Adventure. And be sure to subscribe to the show. That way you won't miss a thing. Great Beer Adventure is part of the Great Pint Society. Cheers. Cheers.